Last December, you might have read about it in the paper, uh, EPA established the final Chesapeake Bay TMDL, and this was a TMDL that set a limit on the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that the bay could receive from the entire watershed in order to meet water quality standards for dissolved oxygen, um, chlorophyll A, and SAV water clarity in all 92 segments, um, tidal segments of the bay where those standards are assessed. And, those, um, those 92 segments, they include water of the District of Columbia, Delaware, um, Virginia, and Maryland. And so we often colloquially refer to the TMDL as the pollution diet. It's kind of saying how much do we have to reduce the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment in order for the bay to be healthy and to achieve those water quality standards. Um, there have been about 40,000 TMDLs established in the United States to date, either by states and approved by EPA or established by EPA directly. Because this one was multi-jurisdictional, the state said, you know what, EPA, you can take the lead on this one, but, but we're going to help you out with it. Um, so as TMDLs go, this one was the largest that's been done to date. And also, it, it is um, on the very comprehensive end of the spectrum, in large part because of our efforts over multiple decades to restore the bay that have um, you know, not yet achieved water quality standards, most notably by 2010. And so we said, well, for this TMDL, in order for EPA to have assurance that those allocations for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment will be achieved and maintained, we're going to have to ask a little more in order to have that assurance because past efforts have fallen short. Um, so we've received several questions. One of the most popular one is, why is EPA establishing the Chesapeake Bay TMDL? Um, it is our obligation under the Federal Clean Water Act to um, have water quality that you know meets, meets its standards as protective of human health and aquatic resources. Uh, it's also because of the insufficient restoration progress that I referenced earlier. Um, and finally, not just did the Clean Water Act say that EPA and the states had to do it, but it also responds to specific court orders and, and legal sell, um, settlements. And it was also a cornerstone of President Obama's executive order strategy that he signed in 2009 and his executive order strategy came out in 2010. Now, throughout the uh, Bay TMDL process, as I mentioned, EPA established the TMDL, but we would not have gotten anywhere were it not for the six states and the District of Columbia. Um, you know, working with our team at the Chesapeake Bay Program Office, we were able to say, this is how much, as a whole, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment the Bay can receive. But states, it's really up to you to say how much of that should go to agriculture, to urban stormwater, to wastewater, to forest. And also it's up to you to tell us how are you going to develop strategies that make the most sense in your state, in your community, to achieve and maintain those allocations. And so we put that question out to the states in D.C. to say, tell us through watershed implementation plans how we should set this pollution diet. Um, and this accountability framework of which the watershed implementation plans were one part became the basis for um, the demonstration to, to EPA of assurance that those allocations could actually be achieved and maintained. Having the states buy-in and ownership of those strategies made us a lot more confident than if EPA just said, okay, 17 million people, this is what you're all going to do. You're with us, right? Um, and it is important to know, I mean, everyone in this group is well aware of the various benefits of healthy water, but oftentimes we hear when we're out on the road, you know, how much is this going to cost farmers? How much of it is going to affect private property? And we just need to highlight that these restoration activities are really um, key to the economic value of the Bay, and, and particularly in Maryland and Virginia. So I mentioned that accountability framework and I just want to spend a moment on it because it's this accountability framework that really sets the Chesapeake Bay TMDL apart from other TMDLs and we often get the question is this what EPA is going to do for the next 40,000 TMDLs and this accountability framework is really unique to the Chesapeake Bay TMDL because of the decades of partnership, the millions of dollars invested in restoring the bay, and we still haven't yet achieved standards. So that's why we kicked it up a notch in this TMDL. Um, now the first part of the framework are the watershed implementation plans, where the states are saying, all right, here's what we're proposing to do 
to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. And here's how we're going to get it done. And when we said to the states, we want you to put together these plans, we asked them to answer a few questions. First of all, what's your current program capacity? Second of all, what are gaps in that program capacity to actually increase that capacity so we could achieve those nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reductions? And third, what's the, what's the time frame and what are the strategies that you're looking to implement over the next 15 years to have all practices in place that would be necessary to meet water quality standards? Um, 2025 is a partnership goal. Maryland has actually taken a step forward and said, you know what, we want to have all of our practices in place by 2020. We want to lead by example. And EPA has said, in order for us to have assurance that you can get all the way there in 2025, we want to know that 60% of the necessary practices in place are in place by 2017. We don't want to be coming back in 2024 and being like, whoops, we missed another deadline. So we want to know that we're on a trajectory. And Maryland, again, leading by example, said, you know what, we want practices in place by 2017 that would achieve 70% of the necessary reductions compared to 2009. Um, so we took all of that information, we put it into the TMDL, um, and then what we're going to be doing in the coming years, starting now, is first, the states already have one set of two-year milestones out on the streets that they adopted in 2009. The next set of two-year milestones that's actually going to be tracked more specifically to the TMD on the watershed implementation plans will have to be in place by January of 2012, so they're beginning to develop those milestones. Um, EPA, working with the jurisdictions, is going to model and monitor progress. And then as necessary, if we see that that progress isn't occurring on schedule or if we're concerned that um, jurisdictions, they aren't committing to milestones or those milestones aren't aggressive enough or jurisdictions aren't putting together phase two watershed implementation plans, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, then we have the authority under the Clean Water Act to take federal actions to basically backstop and ensure that this restoration progress is going to continue on schedule. And that might require um, more stringent permit limits that um, NIPTES permits under the Clean Water Act um, conditioning or redirecting our federal grants, uh, different types of things that we've said we have the authority to do and we're going to step up and use our full authorities as necessary to ensure that restoration continues on schedule. So, um, if for those of you, I know some of you are living the WIP process, so this might be old news for you, but uh, Maryland, Maryland came in with a strong draft WIP back in September. In many of the other jurisdictions, that wasn't the case. And, and the TMDL that we put out for public notice in September, EPA didn't have confidence that those allocations could be achieved and maintained. And in many um, cases, the states actually weren't even proposing enough BMPs or enough wastewater treatment plant upgrades to actually result in the necessary reductions. And so EPA had to take some of those backstop actions that I mentioned in the previous slide, where we actually said, you know what, wastewater treatment plants, we're pushing you closer to the limit of technology. And animal feeding operations that aren't currently under the CAFO program, we're going to put you under the CAFO program and make sure that those controls are in place. And stormwater that's not currently covered by an MS4 permit, we're going to expand that MS4 area through residual designation. Um, the jurisdiction said, EPA, thanks, but no thanks, we would rather do it our way. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that between September and November, December, they worked their tails off and gave us a lot stronger uh, phase one watershed implementation plans where, first of all, they were able to um, actually propose nutrient and sediment reductions that would meet standards. And second of all, they gave us a lot more credible strategies about how and when they were going to get that done. And EPA has said, okay, because of that, we are going to base the final TMDL on what you've told us to do. But in the coming years, it's our job to continue oversight to make sure that's happening. And it's your job to make it happen through the two-year milestones. But I'm proud to say that, you know, we're moving forward as a partnership to actually implement these, these restoration roadmaps. And some of the highlights that came through in the final phase one WIPs were there were additional commitments to more stringent wastewater treatment plant limits. Um, there was increased accountability for urban stormwater programs, such as specifically saying what's going to happen in the next few phase one MS4 permit cycles in Virginia, for example. Um, 
there were commitments to um, strengthen regulatory programs and to pursue rulemakings and to tie those more specifically to components that were identified in the watershed implementation plans. Um, particularly in Pennsylvania, there were new compliance initiatives proposed for agriculture where they actually have some pretty good state programs on the books. It's just not happening. And they're saying, all right, we're going to change how we work with our conservation districts and we're going to put a lot bigger focus on this compliance assurance. Um, there was agreement that if voluntary actions to reduce loads from agriculture weren't meeting the expected reductions, that the state would um, consider in 2013 making mandatory programs and, and expanding their regulatory authority. Uh, there are commitments to expand in, um, the areas where septic systems would have to be upgraded. And finally, there were um, financial and programmatic commitments to implement state-of-the-art technologies, this was particularly true in Pennsylvania, to do more manure to energy technologies that, that, that at the same time would also reduce nutrient loads associated with that manure. Pennsylvania was really leading the charge, but several other states were like, yeah, let's, let's work together and explore these new technologies. So that was then, that was 2010, this is now. And I thought last year was hard. Last year was a little hard. Um, <laughs> we'll be shy. But now the real hard work begins, which does make me a little bit nervous. Um, but it's one of the reasons why I can't spend too much time with this group today, because we're still running around like headless chickens, um, trying to, you know, get the word out that now the hard work really is beginning. And first of all, that hard work is you know, implementing the strategies that are in the phase one watershed implementation plans. We've already had jurisdictions propose legislation that they thought of through the WIP one process. Um, it's also the hard work of, okay, those two year milestones that were adopted in 2009, how's it going states? Are you making those reductions? And what are you gonna do in the next set of two year milestones? Um, we're looking at how we're working with the states to track this data in a way that first of all is more comprehensive than it's been in the past, um, working through our, our NEAN nodes so that we have a better process to actually link our databases with states' databases with other federal agencies' databases and get a, a better understanding of the practices that are on the ground. And also looking at how do we verify those practices. You know, we might have um, some areas coming in saying they have more acres under nutrient management than acres of agriculture that actually exists in a particular area. That's, that's kind of the kind of thing that we're working on our verification protocols to, to sort out. Um, we're also working with the jurisdictions in this phase two WIP process where all along we said we're never going to get there if it's just EPA, the other federal agencies, and the states. So much of this work needs to be the conservation districts, the local governments, planning commissions, the watershed associations, the utilities, and they need to be a part of this strategy too, but we can't do it all in 2010. So we said, let's have a phase two watershed implementation plan process where it's the time for the jurisdictions to engage their local partners and refine those strategies for what they're gonna do over the next 15 or rather now 14 years. Um, so oftentimes we've also heard, you know, we're pushing too hard, we're pushing too quick, and, and this restoration process, it started decades ago and, and we're still looking practices in place in 15 years. So that's half a century of restoration to try to save this bay. And it's by no means going to be easy, but I don't think anyone could actually argue that 50 years is too short a time to try to save this waterway. And I'm sure that many of you in this room feel the same way, which is why you're here. But I just want to share with you some of our key messages. Um, so I mentioned now we're looking at the phase two whips. And We've often referred to the watershed implementation plans as these roadmaps for restoration. And as you all know, a roadmap is totally useless unless you can zoom it in to the scale that actually helps guide you to where you need to go. Um, so the whole purpose of phase two is to make sure that the key local partners that I mentioned earlier actually know what's expected of them to uh, implement these WIPs and feel like they have an opportunity to help develop those strategies and help take ownership of those strategies, just like our, our six states in DC have now taken ownership of the phase one watershed implementation plans and therefore the TMDL. Um, so like I said, all along our intent was to give an additional year of time for the states to work on these phase two WIPs. 
last year when we were working on the TMDL, a couple other needs emerged that are being built into the phase two process. One is that we agreed with the states that we need to make two updates to our model. One relates to how we simulate nutrient management on agricultural lands. The other has to do with how we estimate the number of urban land use acres in the watershed. The state said, okay, we'll, we'll let it pass in 2010, but really make this change in 2011 and let us build it in and adjust our allocations accordingly in the phase two WIP process. So um, we're allowing that to happen as well. And then in jurisdictions where we still had some questions for particular sectors about, you know, were their strategies actually adequate enough to get necessary management on actions on the ground by 2017 and 2025, these phase two WIPs provide us with another opportunity to check in and say, hey, how's that new legislation you talked about going? How's that staffing up that you said that was absolutely critical? How are you refining your strategy to show us, you know, you really can do it and you don't need us to you know, lock down on the wastewater treatment plants or start designating more animal feeding operations or urban areas to come in for permits. And so because of that, because phase two has become a little more uh, complicated, that's why EPA and the principal staff committee now are talking about how sh we should um, revise the phase two WIP schedule to make sure that the states have time to take the results of those two model updates, fully engage their local partners, and get a strong strategy that actually guides restoration for the next 14 years. Um, so the key things that when states say, okay, you know, is there a checklist for phase two? And I said, you know, no, let's not be that boring. And honestly, it's really going to look different in each jurisdiction. How Pennsylvania works with its local governments, you know, the fact that they have townships and boroughs is completely different from um, Maryland with its strong counties, Virginia with its planning district commissions. Some areas need to focus a lot more on the soil and water conservation districts, whereas other areas are really good focusing on the county level. It needs to be tailored. It needs to be flexible. And at the end of the day, EPA just wants to be able to read the WIP and have it be able to tell general story. And we think that the public living in the watershed has the right to read the WIP and be able to understand that story. And what that is is who are the key local implementers? Is it the conservation districts, local governments? Um, utilities, commissions, tell us who needs to be involved. And second of all, are these key partners, are they um, taking ownership of those strategies? Uh, can the state actually document that those key local partners have had a role in developing those phase two strategies? Um, third, we want to know at the state level, what are the jurisdictions helping to do to facilitate local implementation? Because we've heard from many local governments that's great, we want to be with you, but unless the state amends such and such regulation, we don't have the authority. Or unless we get this much more technical assistance, there's no way we can get it done. Or unless permits are written in such and such a way, we're not going to drive these practices down to a local level. So we want to know what are the types of technical assistance, regulatory, um, programmatic approaches that the states are taking to help drive this uh, local level implementation. And finally, we want to know how the federal agencies are contributing to that effort. Um, not just EPA holding out, you know, we might have to do backstops, but how are the other federal agencies? First of all, what are they doing on their own lands and facilities to reduce nutrient and sediment loads? And second of all, this is particularly true with USDA, but also Department of Interior, how are they using their resources, their knowledge, their expertise to help the state succeed in implementing their watershed implementation plan strategies? Um, so that is really, in a nutshell, what the TMDL and the Phase 1 and Phase 2 WIP process is about. I have a couple minutes before I need to jet, but I could answer um, a couple questions and, of course, follow up with me if you have more questions. <laughs>